theyeshiva.net. I want to begin with a little story. I heard this story from a, a friend of mine who lives in Canada, in Montreal, recently moved uh, for part of the year to Muncie. His name is Rabbi Yosef Chesser. He's a Kayan, Rabbi Yosef Hakoyen Chesser. And he shared with me this episode, and it really moved me. He told me that one, that one Shabbat, years ago, it was Parshat Re'ei, which is soon coming up, just in three weeks, the summer. He was in Montreal at home in Canada, and a special guest came to Montreal that Shabbat. This was Harav Hagon, Reb Schneir Kotler, of blessed memory. He was the Rosh Yeshiva of BMG, the famous Yeshiva in Lakewood, New Jersey. Rav Kotler, Reb Schneir Kotler. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Baruch atah adinai eleheinu melech ha'elam shahakhel niya bedvareh. And he said, Friday night, they had what's called an Oynek Shabbat. Chassidim call it a Bata. Some people call it a Kumzitz or Zmiris. You know, they came together in a home. They were eating a little bit, drinking a little bit, saying a Lechayim, enjoying words of Torah, singing songs, connecting. And Reb Shneir Kotler was sitting at the head of the table. And that week, something happened in Montreal. What happened? The city of Montreal did not have yet the strong infrastructure financially and socially that it has today, Baruch Hashem. And there was still, it was a smaller community trying to build itself up. And the Sephardi community in Montreal wanted to build a Jewish day school. But they didn't have enough money. So they went to the Ashkenazim, the Ashkenazim community, and they asked them if they could help them financially with funding the school. And Ashkenazim told us, fired them, listen, we have our own problems, we don't have enough money, we have our own deficit, we have our own headaches. The last thing that we are supposed to do now is get into a whole new headache and a new mess trying to help your schools. You know, you take care of yourselves and let us take care of ourselves. That was the message that they gave. So somebody asked Rav Shnei Kutler, at the Friday night, Oineg Shabbat, what his opinion about this was. And he said something that was simple and profound. He said, it says in Parshat Re'eh, in the Torah portion of Re'eh, Loi sis goidedu, which means the Torah gives a prohibition, you're not allowed to scrape off your skin as a sign of grief. We know that some of the pagan tribes, when somebody would die, one of the things they would do is, they would scrape off, they would cut, they would make gashes and cuts in their skin. And they would sometimes scrape off parts of their epidermis as a sign of grief. So the Torah says, This is not something the Jewish people should do. Your children of Hashem, This is not do. This is not, even when there's grief and there's sadness and there's mourning, God forbid, heaven forbid, somebody passed away, you do not start scraping off your skin. Comes the Gemara. The Gemara in Talmud. Masechet Yevamas Yud Gimel. Tractate Yevamot, page 13. I think it's 13. The Gemara says, Loisis Gaidadu. What does Loisis Gaidadu mean? Loisasu Agudois Agudois. Don't splinter the Jewish people into distinctive, divisive groups. Sizgaidadu from the word aguda, which is a unit. Don't split up into many units. Don't create friction between one community, another community, one group, another group. You have to be able to be unified. Astrup Shnei Kutler, and really the question comes from the Gurari, the Maharal of Prague asks this question. Whenever the sages give an interpretation on the Pasuk in the Gemara or the Medrash, There's always some connection between the literal interpretation and the midrashic Talmudic interpretation. Even if it's a midrashic interpretation, but it's always connected in theme, somehow, some form to the literal interpretation. You'll rarely find a Talmudic interpretation that is completely disconnected to the literal pshat. But here, that's exactly what they do. The literal meaning of Lysis Gaidadu is don't scrape off, don't cut off your skin. 
That's the literal meaning. Comes the Gemara in Yavamis and says, what does it mean? It means don't splinter into groups. What's the connection? There has to be some connection between the Talmudic interpretation and the literal interpretation. But here, not only are they different, they seem worlds apart. Here you're talking about when somebody dies, you shouldn't become so overwhelmed that you start tearing off your skin and ruin and hurt and mutilate your body. And here the Gemara says it's talking about machloikas, not having fights. What's the connection? So Reb Schneir said that really the two interpretations are identical. Not only are they connected, they're really the same. One discusses it in a more revealed level, and one discusses the same mitzvah from a deeper level. It says in Talmud Yerushalmi, Tractate Nedarim, Masechta Nedarim, that the whole Klal Yisrael is like one living organism. We are like one unified body. Yes, there are the arms of the Jewish people and there are the legs of the Jewish people, you know, those who march forward, those who get things done. There are the brains of the Jewish people. There are the hearts of the Jewish people. There is the torso of the Jewish people. The Jewish people have different compartments, different limbs, different organs, different sinews, different bones, different cells, different arteries. Because every soul has its unique role, its unique mission in the destiny of Am Hashem, of God's nation. But the Talmud Yerushalmi says, we are all one body. And he gives an example, he says, imagine my right hand, by mistake, yeah, it touches the stove, and I get burnt, and my whole body, I scream out in pain. So the left arm is not going to take a hammer <laughs> and start beating my right arm. You know why? Because she's also going to suffer from it. She's not going to chop off the right arm, God forbid. Because that means she's also going to suffer because it's all one organism. So the Talmud Yerushalmi says you have to know all the Jewish people are literally like guf echad. It's one larger living organism even if we're distinct and physically we're separate. Said Reb Shneir, the Torah says, Lo Don't mutilate your body. Don't scrape off your skin. Says the Gemara, you know what that means? Lo yisasu agudus agudus. Don't create splits between the Jewish people. You know why? Because when I cut myself off from another Jew, you know what I'm really doing? It's like I'm scraping off my skin. It's like I'm removing part of my body. When you separate from me, or I separate from you, when one community separates from another community, when we create divisiveness, when there's strife, when there's animosity, when there's negative feelings towards each other, the Gemara says, Loi sasu agudas agudas. You know why? That is scraping off skin. Why shouldn't I scrape off skin of my own body? Because it's my own body. I'm hurting myself. When I separate myself from another Jew, when there's a certain person, I say, I can't get along with him or her. I can't speak to them. I can't be close to them. I can't love them. It's not just them that I'm harming. I'm basically harming a very deep part of myself because we're all really one. We are all one larger living organism. We are all one neshama, one soul, even though we have different bodies because everyone is a manifestation of Hashem in their own unique way. But we are all a manifestation of Hashem's light and it's a single light. So the lois is gaidadu of the chumash and the lois is gaidadu of the gemara is really exactly the same thing. And it's such a powerful and true insight that Reb Shneir gave that night in Montreal. Because it's true about each one of us. It's not just the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim. It's with, among the Ashkenazim themselves. And among the Sephardim themselves. It's within one family between siblings and between cousins and between uncles and aunts and brothers-in-law and sisters-in-law and nephews and nieces. It's between friends and neighbors and employers and employees. It's between shuls. It's between communities. And it's between Jews of different cities and different states and different countries and ultimately the whole world. We don't have to agree with each other always. But we have to be able to speak to each other. To communicate to each other. To listen to each other. To love each other. To support each other. To be loyal and dedicated to each other. And to be here for each other. Through thick and through thin. I'm going to share with you an amazing story that I have read. Now you're going to ask me, is it a true story? Did it really happen? I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to tell you my sources, 
Everyone can research it on their own. Whether it's authentic or it's inauthentic, one thing I know, the insight is incredibly powerful. There's a book that's a biography about the Chassam Seifer. The Chassam Seifer was a Jew known as Reb Moshe Seifer, Reb Moshe Schreiber. Many of the Seifers of the Schreibers today are descendants of the Chassam Seifer, Rabbeinu Moshe Seifer, who was the chief rabbi of Preshburg. Preshburg was in the Hungary, Austria-Hungarian Empire. The Chassam Seifer passed away in the year Tovkov Tzadik Tes or Tov Reish, which would mean around 1840. And the Chassam Seifer had a son, his name was the Ksav Seifer, who succeeded his father as the rabbi of Preshburg. Today it's the city of Bratislava. He had a son, his name was Reb Shloyme Seifer. Reb Shloyme Seifer wrote a biography about his grandfather, the Chassam Seifer, called Chut HaMeshulash, the triple thread. Now, today a lot of biographies, I don't know what to say, sometimes I read one biography, another biography, they all look exactly the same. The same thing, the guy, the kid grew up, when he was six years old, he knew the whole Tanakh, when he was nine, he knew the whole Shas. It's almost like you could predict the biography before, everybody is perfect, everybody is impeccable, everybody is flawless. The biographies are not always so honest. But uh, the Chut HaMashulish, it's a very interesting biography, it's an old, old biography, the time when not many biographies were written, and it was written by a grandson. Literally in the 1800s, so it's, a, it's, a, it's I would assume, a pretty authentic biography. I saw this myself in the biography. He has a footnote in one of the pages. And he says, I want to share a story that I have heard. The tradition came to me. And he says that I heard this. And this is not so many years after it happened. I'll tell you the story. This is a story that happens in the 1700s. It's the sad days when there is a big machloket. There's a big dispute between the Hasidim and the opponents of the Hasidim known as the Misnagdim. And the great Gaon of Vilna, Rabbeinu Eliyahu of Vilna, Zechet Tzadik Levracha, the famous Gaon of Vilna, wrote, signed a cherem, a, a ban, an excommunication against the young, budding Hasidic movement. The Vilna Gaon had a beloved student known as Reb Zalman Valozhner. He was a brother of the great Reb Chaim Valozhner. Reb Chaim Valozhner of course, became known as the rabbi and the founder of the great Lithuanian yeshiva known as the Valozhna yeshiva. But he had a brother, Reb Zalman, who used to say, is far greater than my, I am in Tyre. And he was a beloved, beloved student of the Vilna Gaon. And he tells there a story that they came to Reb Zalman, you Valozhna, and they asked him if he would sign the cherem, the ban of the Vilna Gaon against the Hasid. And he refused. And they asked him, why are you refusing? He says, I don't, I don't want to sign a cherem. He said, but your Rebbe, the Vilna Gon, is a Malach Hashem Tzvois. He's an angel of Hashem, and he signed it. How could you not sign it? And he says, Reb Zalman, you said, I want to ask you guys a question. Every morning we read about the Akedah of Yitzchak, the binding of Yitzchak in Parshas Vayera. And it tells there a story. God tests Avraham. And he tells Avraham, take your son, your only son, the one you love, Yitzchak, bring him up to Mount Moriah, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice, burnt offering to Hashem. Who told this to Avram Avinu? Ha'eloikim. The Rebbeinu Shalolam Hashem. Avram Avinu wakes up in the morning, he settles the donkey, he takes Yitzchak, and they're on their journey. The third day he sees the place, he goes with Yitzchak, they come there. Avram builds an altar, he arranges the wood, he ties Yitzchak on top of the altar, on top of the wood. Vayishlach Avram es yodai vayikach asama achelas lishchet es benoi. Avram Avinu fetches his sword. He's about to slaughter his son. What happens next? Vayikre love Malach Hashem min Hashemayim. Vayoymer Avram Avram vayoymer Hineni vayoymer Al Tishlach Yodcha El Hanar Val Tas Loi Muuma Ki Ato Yadati Kirel Kimato. 
an angel of Hashem calls out from heaven to Avraham. Avraham says, here I am. And what does the angel say? Do not lay your hand on the lad. Do not do anything to him. Ask Reb Zalman, he says, I have a big question. Who sent Avraham to do the Akedah? Who is the one who sent him on the mission to sacrifice his son? Ha'elikim, Hashem, Hashem himself. Who is the one who tells Avraham Avinu not to do it? Malach Hashem in Hashemayim, an angel. Says Reb Zalman, I don't understand. Hashem is the one who told him to go. Hashem should be the one to tell him don't. If Hashem is not the one to tell him not to, it's a malach, so why didn't the malach send him? What happened to Hashem? Hashem is the one who sends him on a mission and then he disappears. And suddenly there's an angel from Hashem telling Avram Avinu not to slaughter his son. What happened to Hashem? You're the one who sent him. Tell him not to do it. Why are you sending an angel at the end of the story? What happened between the beginning and the end of the story? Where did Hashem disappear to? Interesting question. The answer he gave was incredible. I have to say it in Yiddish, you'll forgive me, and then I'll translate it. Said the great, brilliant, powerful student of the Vilna God, the Heiliker of Zalman Valarjana. He said, when Hashem wants to tell you not to slaughter a Jewish child, he could send an angel, that's enough. He could send a malach min hashamayim to come and say, al tishlach yod chelanar, don't slaughter a Jewish boy. But if Hashem wants you to slaughter a Jewish child, he can send a malach. It's not going to work. An angel won't cut it. He has to come himself and tell you, go slaughter a Jewish boy. Said Reb Zalman, you, my Rebbe is a Malach Hashem Tzvokas. My Rebbe is an angel, an angel of Hashem. But you're asking me to slaughter a Jewish community. You're asking me to cut out a Jewish community. You're asking me to amputate from Klal Yisrael a Jewish community. This I have to hear. From Hashem Himself, not from a malach, not from an angel. This is something Hashem Himself has to communicate to me. And the Chutam Meshulish continues. Rabbi Kiva Yosef Schlesinger was one of the great Goinim of Yerushalayim. He has a sefer, I believe it's called Torah Sichil, and I think on Parshas Vayera, he also writes the same story. What does this mean to us? If Hashem wants you to save a child, He could send an angel. An angel is enough. But if I'm going to slaughter another Jew, physically or verbally with my mouth, with my tongue, or with my writing, or with my comments, or with my statements, or with my behavior, an angel is not enough. I have to hear it from Hashem Himself. Before I do something, anything, to cut down my relationship with another Jew, to cut somebody out of my life, to ban them, to excommunicate them, to separate them from me, I have to hear these words from Hashem. Because this is such a powerful and such a serious thing. This is not something you do lightly. My dearest friends, before we start Shemayna Esri, every day, Every night, three times a day, we say a posuk from Tehillim. Adonai svasai tiftach ufi yageti lasach. Hashem, open up my lips. Unzip my lips. Unzip my lips. Let my mouth utter your praise. This is the verse with which we open up our davening. But it's a statement that accompanies us in our mind before we open our mouth to pray. We're asking from Hashem to open our lips. Why? 
Davin, Davin, what are you asking from Hashem? Of course, he's responsible for me opening my lips. He's responsible for everything that's happening in my biological system. The fact that my living organism could function is only because of Hashem's energy at this very single moment. All of the nine systems in my body are due to Hashem. When I open my mouth to say something, I have to realize how powerful those words are going to be. Because let's remember, how did Hashem create the world? What do our sages teach us? In Pirkei Avot, 5th chapter. Hashem created the world through words. Why is that important for you and me to know? Not just to understand how DNA works, but also to understand that just like Hashem created the world through words, it means that the world is made up of words. It means that if you go to the essence of the world, you know what you're going to find? Words. Words and letters are the stuff, the material, the fabric from which our world is created, which today we call DNA, which is compared to letters. The DNA, the double genome, the genetic code, the the nucleus of every single cell of the 50 or 60 or 70 trillion cells in the human body. But it also means something else. It means that if Hashem created the world through words, we can also create the world through words. It also means that we can destroy the world through words. It means that words have the impact to destroy people. It means that when I open my mouth, my words can either heal or my words can destroy. So we say, Hashem, open my lips. Let my mouth utter your praise. Let my mouth communicate words of love, compassion, affection, friendship, Ahavat Yisrael, Achadut Yisrael. When I open my mouth, let my mouth become a conduit for your compassion, for your love, for your grace. Every word that I speak throughout the day to my children, to my wife, to my husband, to my friends, to my students, to my employers, employees, friends, neighbors, relatives, strangers, the mailman, the person in the gas station, the person in the mall, the person in the store, people I know, people I don't know. Every word I say can either be a conduit for Hashem's love, light, and compassion to bring out the best in people, or God forbid those words could have an opposite effect. So I say to Hashem, open my lips, unzip my lips, let me realize what is contained in my lips. Let me realize the power and the potency in every communication. I want to tell you an incredible story. This was shared by a Jewish man. He is today the leader of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra. His name is Benjamin Zandman. Benjamin Zandman grew up as a Jew in Great Britain. Today, as I said, he lives in Massachusetts. And he's a great conductor. And he once shared a story. He said he heard this from a Jewish woman who was an Auschwitz survivor. And she said that she was placed on one of those cattle cars on the train together with her eight-year-old brother. She was a 15-year-old Jewish girl and her brother was eight years old at the time. Their parents were gone. They disappeared. So it was just her and her brother. The train was taking them to Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp, but of course they did not know about that. And on the train ride, she realized that her brother was missing one of his shoes in the whole commotion as the Germans were placing the Jews onto the cattle carts. You know how they would push them, push them, push them. One of his shoes got lost. And she turns to her brother and she starts screaming at him like an older sister sometimes screams at a younger brother. Why are you so irresponsible? Why did you lose a shoe? Tati and mommy are not here. Where am I going to go? We're going to go to a new place. Where am I going to find you a shoe? Now you're going to be walking around with one shoe. It's not, you're not going to be able to function this way. I can't understand how immature you are. You're such a baby. And you have to be more responsible. Oh, did she give her brother a piece of her mind because she felt responsible. She herself was lost and broken, 15-year-old girl, Nabach. And now she has to take care of this boy. They're coming to a new place and he doesn't have, he doesn't have a shoe. And she tells Mr. Zanman, she says, Oh, do I regret those words I told my brother because they were the last words 
I ever told him. A few minutes later, the doors opened up and we were shoved out of that train into that infamous planet of hell called Auschwitz-Birkenau. In the selection process, Joseph Mengele sent my brother in one direction, me in another direction. I never saw or heard my brother again. One or two hours later, he ascended in the smoke of the crematoria. I was sent to the work barracks and I survived the war. And in January 1945, when the Soviets liberated Auschwitz, I went into a free world. And at that moment, I made two oaths, two shvuot, I made two oaths. Oath number one was, I decided I'm going to step into life. I'm not going to surrender to despair and depression, but I'm going to allow myself to be transformed from death to life. I'm going to crawl out of the emotional and physical abyss and start living. I also made a second oath to myself. And that is, I would never, ever tell anybody, especially a child, something that could not stand as my last words that I would ever tell to this person. Learning the lesson of what happened with my brother, I told myself, I will never say anything to anybody if I knew that these words I would not be proud of if it was the last message I ever gave them. And when I heard this, I thought to myself, wow, that's, those are big shoes to step into, pun intended. That's quite a feat. It's quite an oath. It's quite a task. And I, know, I don't know that I'm up for it. <laughs> Maybe you guys. I don't know that I'm up for such a task. I do a lot of speaking. And I can't say that I'm ready for this. I can't. But I do say it's something I could think about. It's something I can aspire to. It's something that we can think about. That before I open my mouth, I say, Hashem, Svasai Tiftoch, Ufi Yagati Lasecha. I want to make sure that the words that are coming out of my mouth are capturing your infinite love. I want to make sure that these words that are coming out of my mouth are basically me communicating your words. I want to be a conduit for your words. I want these words to bring out the best in people. I want these words to accentuate the holiness in people, the goodness in people, the kindness in people, the kedusha, the godliness in people. This doesn't mean that sometimes my words may not be discipline-oriented, discipline, discipline oriented, or sometimes there has to be words of chastisement, toichich or musr, or sometimes there has to be words of critique. But even those words must be filled with compassion, with sensitivity, with a commitment to truth, and with a commitment to the infinite love that Hashem has to every single one of His creatures, and to every single person, person in the world, Toiv Hashem Lakel Virachem of Al especially when we're talking about Yisrael Am Kiroivoi, his people. The Nitziv, the great Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, the Rosh Hashiva of Alajan, who was through marriage a grandson of Reb Chaim Valajan, whom I mentioned a few minutes ago, says a beautiful interpretation. It says in Parshat Bereshit, Hashem says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to create a helper against him. And he creates Chava, Adam's wife, asks the Nitziv, against him? A wife is supposed to be for you, not against you. Ezer Imoi, not Ezer Kenegdoi. Ezer Imoi, Itoi, Lazor Oto, Lazor Elav. What's Ezer Kenegdoi? Rashi asks the question. If she's a help, She's not the opposition, and if she's the opposition, she's not a help. What's this Ezek and Negda? It's a contradiction. And Rashi gives the famous interpretation from the Gemara, Zoha Eleizer, Loi Zoha 
the Nitziv, Reb Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, Zeichet Tzadik Levracha, gives a fascinating interpretation. And he says in his commentary on Chumash, Hamik Dover, Harchiv Dover, he says, you know, the Torah is describing here the essence of marriage. The essence of marriage is that you have two people who don't always agree. And by not agreeing, they help each other because they teach everyone a different perspective. Ezer Kenegdoi. Sometimes you give me my most help in life, Kenegdoi. When you challenge me to think about things differently, to broaden my horizons, to expand my perspective, to look at things from a different perspective. When you learn Gemara, any piece of Gemara from Meseches Brachas, the first Mishnah Meseches Brachas, the last Mishnah Meseches Uktzen, what do you see throughout the Talmud? They don't stop arguing. Nobody. Nobody stops arguing. Everyone is arguing all the time. The first Mishnah, you open up the Mishnah, you hope there'll be a little peace. Right away there's an argument, a three-way argument. Till when can you reach Shema? Rebbe Lezer says, At Seif HaShemur HaRishoyna. Chachamim say, At Chatzois. Rebbe Gamliel says, At Sheyal HaMud HaShachar. Till dawn, right away there's an argument. Next mission, another argument, and so on and so forth. From brachas to peya to dmai to kilayim, shviyas, trumas, maishas, maishas, sheni, chal, arla, bakurim, etc., shabbos, eriv, and all the way down. There's one chapter that doesn't have an argument. One chapter. You know which one? Masech Zvachim. I think it's chapter 7. And it became such a big thing. You know how I know it became a big thing? They got so excited that there was no argument. The Beis Yosef says, they put it into davening. <laughs> we're a zehu mekoyman shal zvachim kachay kadashim shchitatan b'tzafon parvis yishol makbudim until the end enoy nechal alatzali. Why do we say this chapter in davening? So the Beis Yosef brings an erechaim because it's the one shout doesn't have an argument, doesn't have a machloika. So we start davening this way. So why do we have to put it into davening? Every other chapter has a machloika because the truth is Judaism doesn't see debates as a negative thing. Our whole culture of learning is filled with debates. The Gemara says in Erev, in page 13, Yud Gimel, Elu ve'elu divrei lekem chayim. These and these are the words of the living God. And it's daf Yud Gimel, Yud Gimel begematria echad. Because echad could contain Elu ve'elu, and they both come from one God. The Gemara in Chagiga Dav Gimel, it comes from one shepherd. Elu ve'elu divrei lekem chayim. It comes from echad, it's page Yud Gimel. And that's also the gematria of Ahava, Aleph, He is 6, and Vez, He is 5 and 7. 6 and 7 is 13. Ahav and Echad, we can debate. Elu ve Elu, we're still one. Because Echad is Aleph is 1, and Ches is 7 heavens and earth, and Dalit is the four directions of the world. And different aspect, different people give a different perspective, and it expands our horizons. Says the Netziv, the best thing in marriage is that you have another person who teaches you how to see things differently. Don't get scared, don't try to crush her, and don't run away emotionally to China. Stay present because both of you will become larger than yourselves, larger than your egos, and that's how you grow to become great people. I saw a t-shirt I'm very easy to get along with once you learn to worship me. But that's not the way it goes. But before davening, we look for that chapter that has no disagreements. Because before davening, we want to focus on the oneness. That's why the Arizal writes, the Arizal, whose yard site is Hey Av, just a few days before Tisha B'Av, Hey Av, the fifth day of Av, is the yard site of the famous Arizal in the year Shin Lamed Beis, according to most, 1572. And the Arizal instituted that before davening, you should say, Hareini mekabel alai mitzvet asei shal v'haftal recha I accept upon myself the mitzvah of loving another Jew like I love myself. Why this mitzvah before davening? Every mitzvah is good to accept before davening. I don't say before davening, I accept upon myself not to eat non-kosher. Or I accept upon myself not to wear shatnas, wool and linen. Or I accept upon myself to make sure there's a mezuzah on my door. It's a beautiful thing, but what's the connection here? Why before davening am I accepting on myself the mitzvah of Ahavat Yisrael? And the answer to this is, my dearest friends, what's the greatest source of pain for parents when their children don't get along? You know, when a mother and a father remember their little kids, boy chicks, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, they played together and they fought together and they ran around together and they did all these projects together. 
and they grew up in one home with one father and one mother who loved them to pieces. And then they grow older and older and older and their lives drift apart and then they get into a fight. They can't be peaceful with each other. Oh, it kills parents. It's mummish. It's a stab. It's a stab in the chest. What's the greatest joy for parents? When they see that their siblings really get along with each other. They love each other. They're here for each other. They support each other. Maybe they're different. No siblings are alike. They're different. But they care for each other. I care for you. What's the most aggravating thing for Hashem? When the kids don't get along. He says, my kinderlach, they're all for me. Why are they not getting along? It hurts Hashem. What's the greatest pleasure for Hashem? When he sees that the children get along. So the Arizal says, before you start davening, you want Hashem, you want to reach out to your Father in Heaven. The first thing you know what you tell Him. Hareini mekabal alai mitzvah sasei shalvaftalecha I get along with all my brothers. I get along with all my sisters. Hashem hears this. Ah, mechaya. He's so happy. There's such a nachas ruach. There's such a ta'anug. There's such a pleasure. There's such a delight. The kinderlach get along. Now, whatever you want to ask for Hashem, everything is different. You created so much pleasure, so much delight by Hashem. Now, Hashem will give you what you need, what you want. Because the deepest pleasure is when we're here for each other. The Radak says, why are we called matot? Sticks, matot. We just had Vayedaber Moshe El Roshe Hamatos. Sometimes we're called Shvatim, which are tribes, also sticks, scepters. Sometimes we're called matos, right? The Shvatim are called matos. Sticks, why sticks? Literally because we're branches from one tree. We come from one tree, Yaakov Avinu, and it's 12 branches, the 12 Shvatim. The Radak says something beautiful. He says, Mata is something that you could lean on, you could support. You could find support in it. People go hiking, and they have a hiking stick. Or people get a little older, and they need a cane to support them when they walk, because it's strong. We call the Jews matos. What does it mean to be a Jew? To be a Jew means that you are a source of support for another person. You're a mata. You're a stick that people could lean on you, could support, could find support in you. We don't have to agree with each other, just like a husband and a wife don't have to agree with each other. That's not so important. What's important is to respect each other, to love each other, to be loyal to each other, to give people the benefit of the doubt. When a husband starts thinking that his wife is out to get him, and the wife thinks he's out to get her, oy va voy. If you disagree, that's normal. You're different people. You have different perspectives. You have different glasses. But you have to feel that I'm here for you. I'm not here to get you. I'm here to support you and you have to feel the same and then our disagreements could become actually interesting they can expand us same is true with the jewish people let's not agree with each other god forbid too much but let's always be here for each other listen to each other understand even if we have a disagreement so what so what so we have a disagreement so we have different perspectives so you're into this and i'm into this you like chocolate ice cream i like vanilla ice cream okay you dive in this nusach i dive in that nusach I focus on this mitzvah more. You like to focus on this mitzvah. You have this minik. I have that minik. So what? So we're different. We have different personalities sometimes. We may even have serious disagreements about different things in life. But never, ever, ever should that be a reason for contention, for mistrust. We have to transcend the instinct of drifting away from each other. I want to share something with you very personal. I have had the privilege over the last years, before Corona, to visit, I think, every single type of Jewish community in the world. I can't say I visited every community, but I think I visited every type of community. One day I could be in Yeshiva University, or in a modern Orthodox community in Tinek. The same night, I'm invited to a Satme community, Hasidic, very Hasidic community in Williamsburg, or in Monroe. Then I could be addressing Breslov and Hasidim. Then a Litvish community, a Yeshivish community in Lakewood. And then another Hasidic community. And then another type of Yeke community. And an Oibelander community. 
and a very yeshivish community, and a more light yeshivish community, and Bobiv, and Popa, and Ger, and Vizhnitz, and Sans, and Satmer, and this Satmer, and that Satmer, and Bells, and Kloisenberg, and Skver, and even Chabad invites me once in a while. And sometimes I'm invited to reform congregations or communities, conservative, sometimes very secular JCCs, universities, schools, and sometimes even non-Jewish communities, Lahavdal. But I'm talking within the Jewish community, and I get to see the spectrum. And everybody is unique and precious in their own way. And like all of us, we have our flaws, we have our virtues. And I have seen something in the last few years I want to share with you. It used to be, and I'm being very blunt and honest with you, when I was a kid, if somebody would get up in a particular community and spew words against another community, they could sometimes become popular from that. It was like almost, oh, you took a position and people liked it. Today, it really doesn't sell. People are fed up with divisiveness. Today, the Jewish people are yearning for camaraderie. Doesn't mean we agree about everything. It doesn't mean we don't see things differently. It doesn't mean we see everything eye to eye. But the Jewish people in their hearts of hearts, almost everywhere I go, they're craving a language of achdos. They, we had enough of strife and animosity and politics and corruption. And just because you don't look like me or you have a different minig or you have a different philosophy and this, therefore you're disqualified and you're a heretic and I can't talk to you. People are sick and tired of that. It does not sell anymore because it doesn't work anymore because it's not real, especially the youth. The youth cannot handle it. When they hear such words, they get so turned off. And I want to say, especially in Israel, this is such a sad phenomenon because most Jews understand this very deeply. You know, Israel is a very, very diverse community. I go to Israel often. I speak to religious Zionists. For them, Rav Kook is the Tzadik Hadar. And then I sometimes speak to people from a very, very different extreme. Sometimes very right-wing, sometimes very left-wing, sometimes in the middle. And you see that deep down, Kalal Yisrael wants to be one. And it doesn't mean I have to put on your hat and I have to see everything like you. But it does mean that I have to realize that we're one family. We are brothers and sisters. And unless God tells me to slaughter another Jew, I don't slaughter another Jew. I'm sorry. And I'll tell you something else. I always think, people sometimes say, how do you go there? How do you speak there? How do you talk to them? And I think to myself, you know, you know who I learned from? You'll forgive me. And I hope this doesn't come out wrong. But I ask myself, was he or she Jewish enough for Mengele to send them to the gas chambers? If he or she was Jewish enough for Mengele to send them to the gas chambers... They're Jewish enough for me to love them. If they were Jewish enough for Mengele Yemach Shemoy to hate them, and with cold-blooded German precision, move his thumb to the right or to the left, condemning them to horrific torture and death. If he was Jewish enough for that Yemach Shemoynik, to say this man or woman or child must be exterminated within the next hour under Rudolf Hess's brilliant, structured, systemized, and organized mass killing. He or she is Jewish enough for me to hug them, for me to kiss them, at least before Corona, for me to embrace them physically and post-Corona emotionally. Somebody sent me a beautiful clip, beautiful clip from Israel. There was a fellow, an old man, at a bus stop. He was waiting for a bus. And near him, there's another guy who's also waiting for a bus. He's young. And this young guy is with headsets. And the music is blasting. And of course, it's rock and roll music. <laughs> it's not Hasidish music or Mojitz in Nagunim or even Svardish in Nagunim or even Mordechai ben David in Nagunim. <coughs> or Yeshiva Shinigunim, or even Pirche, or London School of Jewish Music. It's real rock and roll, you know, blasting away. And this old man is like looking at this young Chevreman. Uh, and the old man takes out a candy to eat. And he takes out another candy. And he gives it to the young man near him, listening to the rock and roll. 
And he says, here is a candy, Achi, my brother. Here is a candy for you, my brother. The young man looks at him and says, what? He says, brother, here's a candy. He says, I don't need your candies. And besides, you're not my brother. He says, why do you say I'm not your brother? He says, I eat shrimp. I eat lobster. I don't keep Shabbos. I'm not religious. I don't believe in Torah. And the old man says, okay. So we disagree, but we're still brothers. He says, no, no, no. Anach lo achim. You don't think I'm your brother. You think people like me who serve in the army go to hell. You think people like me go to the abyss. You don't believe that we're brothers. The old man looks at him and says, we could disagree and still be brothers. He says, really? Why don't you come with me to the restaurant, the tray for restaurant to eat shrimp? He says, just because I don't go to the same restaurant like you, it doesn't mean we're not brothers. The young man rolls up his sleeve and shows him a tattoo. Tattoo is engraved in his arm with a big gun. He says, this is who I am. You still say you're my brother with these tattoos? You don't think I'm Jewish, do you? And the old man rolls up his sleeve. And he shows him a tattoo engraved in his skin with numbers. And he says... I also have a tattoo. For many years ago, I also have a tattoo. And I could tell you, you have a tattoo, I have a tattoo. Different types of tattoos, but we're brothers. The young man melted. He says, what makes us brothers? Why do you think so? And he says, I had a teacher. Hayali more, I had a teacher. And he taught me that we're brothers. Oy, did he teach me that we're brothers. And the young man says, who is this teacher? And the old man says, his name was Adolf Hitler. He taught me that we're brothers. And he transforms in a few minutes the life of this young person. It's a sad lesson, but what a powerful lesson. All our differences in the world that we have never are strong and deep enough to be able to truly separate us from each other. And if you don't believe me, look at our enemies. We have to learn from our enemies. They don't see the differences. They don't look at what hat you wear. They don't look at what type of jacket you wear. They don't want to know how many times in the morning you go to the mikveh. They want to know if you say Baruch Shama before Haidu or Haidu before Baruch Shama. It almost makes no difference. Yes, there are differences. Maybe some fundamental differences in approach. But if each of our souls is a chelik eleikami mal mamish, if every one of our souls is a piece of Hashem, I may not always agree with you, but always, always love you support you, be here for you, be sensitive to each other, be respectful towards each other, and learn how to communicate about our differences without negativity, without toxicity. And that requires three conditions. Condition number one is give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't right away think, because you have a different opinion, therefore... You're bad, you're malicious, you mean negative. No, you may just have a different way of looking at it. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't right away judge them based on their words or based on their perspectives, number one. Number two, communicate with people. Talk to them and listen to them. And number three, remember that under all circumstances, when we amputate a part of the Jewish people, and we separate them from us, we're amputating a piece of ourselves. To hate you means that I hate me, because we're one. If I cannot get along with you, it's only because I cannot get along with myself.
if I would be able to really get along with myself, if I really liked myself, all parts of me, I can get along with you. People who hate other people, it's because they hate parts of themselves and the other person reminds them of who they are. So my dearest friends, I bless you and I bless me and I bless all of us that this time of physical distance, of physical separation, of quarantine that came from the coronavirus and COVID-19, this time that forced us to stay home much more, not to be able to go to shul in the same way that we did before. This time that physically put us into quarantine should also be a time in which spiritually we become closer than ever because the distance not only makes heart, the heart grow fonder, absence makes the heart grow fonder, but it also allows us in a new way to appreciate the value of family, the value of community, and that all the arguments and fighting in the world are simply not worth it. In the big picture, it's a game. It's an ego game. It's a game of pettiness. It's a game of foolishness. It's a game of stupidity. We are bigger than that. We are larger than that. We have to be able to learn to forgive, to embrace, because you'll never, ever regret not getting into a fight with somebody. You may regret the opposite. If I decide I'm not connected with you anymore, I may have deep regrets. But if I decide we're going to stay connected, we're going to work on our differences, you'll never, ever regret it. Choose the deeper life. Choose the broader life. Choose the higher life. Choose the life that keeps you connected to infinity, that keeps you connected to the source of everything, that keeps you connected to Hashem, who unites all of us because we are all part of Him. Ein Oid Mulvadai. Thank you very, very much. I think, Rabina, we're going to take some questions, right? What do you do if a family member has done something that is not right, something that is very nasty or selfish, something that hurt you or your family member? Do you not cut them off from your life? Okay, it's a good question. And I'll be very honest with you. It hurts, but do not cut off a family member from your life. It's very, very serious. Before you cut off a family member from your life, you have to be, let make sure Hashem tells it to you directly. Do what the Rambam says in Hilchas Deus chapter 6. Speak to them. Make an appointment. Sit down. Don't just send a text. Sit down. Make an appointment. Discuss it with them. Ask them. Why? What happened? Why would you do this to me? Don't blame them. Just tell them about your feelings. Generally, when you talk to people, instead of telling them what they did, tell them what you feel about what they did, because that they can't argue with you. If I tell you, you're so selfish, you tell me, I'm not selfish. But what if I tell you, you know, when you said that, it hurt me, it was just my feelings that were hurt. What are you going to argue, that I wasn't hurt? Share with them your feelings. Share with them what it did to you. And listen to them. You'll be surprised. Maybe they'll say, I'm sorry. Maybe they had a different calculation. Maybe they didn't realize what happened. Maybe they got wrong information. Maybe you'll find out that there's nobody to talk to and that they're just very tough and non-movable and it's non-negotiable and it's my way or the highway. And you know what? Even then, you don't have to cut them off. You could just make boundaries. Sometimes we have to make boundaries between ourselves and certain people. But you don't cut people out of your life very, very, very rarely. Sometimes a case of serious abuse or danger, sometimes you have to do that. But generally speaking, there shouldn't be anybody in the world that you're not on speaking terms with. Soon Mashiach is going to come. It's going to be embarrassing to say, this Jew I don't speak to. You want to be able to be on good terms with everybody. It doesn't mean everybody's your best friend. It doesn't mean everybody you're so comfortable with. Sometimes there are people who are, share our frequencies and some people don't. But you can even agree to disagree. Sometimes you say, you know, this person, they really, they don't get me. I don't get them. So you have boundaries. But don't maintain a fight. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin, Ein machzikin b'machloikas. 
Sometimes we argue, don't hold on to grudges, don't hold on to machlaikas. This is not something you want to do. Even if they did something that was wrong, talk to them about it. Tell them how you're feeling. Don't sit and harbor grudges in your heart. Somebody once said that harboring a grudge against other people is basically like inhaling poison, hoping that your enemy is going to die from the poison. (laughs) The grudges affect us more than they affect anybody else. It's not good to live with grudges. You have to talk to the person. Share with them your feelings. Maybe they'll understand and apologize. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll have a different perspective. And you know what? Okay. So you have boundaries. You realize maybe there's certain things you can't really communicate to them. There's certain things they will never see it your way. But that's fine. That's also fine. Create healthy boundaries so you don't get hurt in the future. But I would not just cut people off and hold on to negative energy. It's just not, I don't think it's the way to do it. I think it's not good. It's toxic for families and for communities. It's really not a way to go. Uh, how do people deal with parents and having the issue of kibbutz avayim when they feel that the parents are actually doing them damage? Kibbutz avayim is a mitzvah to respect the father and mother and help them in their needs. If, as a result of honoring my father and mother, <coughs> I'm, be- I'm getting damaged, for example, if mother and father, <coughs> excuse me are doing things or saying things that hurt the children for whatever reason, then you're not obligated in the mitzvah of kibbutz aim if it's hurting you and damaging you. You're not. For the specifics, you can discuss it with an, a rabbi who you trust, who is smart, who is sensitive, who is wise, and who understands the situation. But generally speaking, kibbutz aim doesn't mean that you have to allow yourself to be abused. Kibbutz aim means it's a great mitzvah and a great privilege to help my father and mother, to respect them, to have reverence of them, and to help them in their needs. But if somebody thinks kibbutz of aim means they allow their mother or their father to behave in a way that is, that is inappropriate, that's not kibbutz of aim. And you're not helping them, and you're not helping yourself. Sometimes we need boundaries with our parents, but it's important that you should get an objective opinion here. Because sometimes we get very, very biased, and we have blind spots. It's important to bring in somebody who's maybe a professional, a therapist, uh, an expert in this area, an arbitrator, a good friend, a good confidant, a good rabbi, a good rebbitzin, to help you navigate this, especially if there's abuse in the family. If you're dealing with parents who have been abusive to children, then the whole, it's a game, and then it's a whole different game here. Then maybe it may, be the, it may be forbidden for you to hang out over there because it could be harming your health. You know, a, a woman turned to me recently, It's hard for me to say, but her father molested her for many years. And her father has the chutzpah to tell her that she has to come visit him because kibbud of. And I told her, it's forbidden for you to go visit him. Every time she goes to visit him, she's in trauma for three months and she can't live normal. She has a big family. She can't be there for her kids because her father never even apologized. The guy didn't apologize for what he did to his daughter. So I don't know the situation here, and I'm not, God forbid, suspecting this about any father or mother. I'm just saying, you have to realize, kibbut of aim does not mean to allow yourself to get abused. Kibbut of aim means to help your father and mother in their needs, not in a way that's abusing you. If they are completely abusive, then you need the proper boundaries and get a professional to help you construct those boundaries. Even then, I would say, in most cases, do not cut your parents out of your life. That is why unwise, because parents are still parents, and we need a relationship with our parents. If it's very difficult, you need the proper boundaries. You have a problem that you try a lot of times not to pay attention. The problem is very deep, but you feel it's not a sincere situation. It had a long time, this problem. What else can I do? It makes me very sad just to hear about them. Exactly your sister and brother-in-law. Basically, you have a problem with your sister and brother-in-law and it has been resolved. I would, I don't know your sister and brother-in-law, but I'll tell you what I would do. I would go meet them in a private time and really just be very open and, and nice and warm with them and say, listen, you know, I'm not judging you, I'm not your mentor, I'm not your mashpi, I'm not your rabbi or rebbe or rosh yeshiva. 
But I just want to share, for me it's important that our family loves each other and we remain united. And I feel, you know, maybe I was hurt or this one was hurt and I wanted to share this with you, you know, get your feedback, tell me how I'm feeling and let's try to move beyond this, you know, could we be civil, could we be warm towards each other? But I would try to be nice, compassionate, but also firm, real, authentic. Choose your words wisely. You don't want to distance people more. You know, give them the benefit of the doubt. But the good things can happen. You may hear a perspective that they share. You may find out that they are in deep pain. Maybe they're responding to some delusion that they're having. It could be a distortion. But when we communicate and speak, we get to hear sides. And don't come and blame. Tell them how you're feeling and say, I want to hear what you have to say. And you know what? Maybe you can emerge from that conversation much closer. Maybe you'll emerge from that conversation and say, you know, they're really on a different planet. They see things completely different. And then, too, don't live with negativity. Maybe you have to create boundaries that are safe. You know, there's certain times you meet, there's certain times you communicate, you know where the pitfalls are. But do it from a much more broader place. You be the big person here. Don't be small. Don't be petty. Don't go down the path of, I'll get you back, I'll show you, I'll take revenge. Because basically it makes everybody, it diminishes everybody, destroys everybody. I'll tell you a beautiful little story that I heard. Somebody emailed it to me a little while ago. There's a Jew in Israel, his name is Reptuvia Pelas. He's a character. There was once a fight between two leaders of two Jewish institutions in Israel. Not the first fight that ever was. They had two institutions, two mosdot of Torah, and they got into a fight, you know, one of these fights. And uh, it was pretty, it was not very civil. So Tuvia Pellis, Rabbi Tuvia Pellis, who's a philanthropist, he's a man of means, or he used to be a man of means, I hope he's still a man of means. He had like influence because he's a philanthropist, he was affluent, influential. He was once in New York for Shavuos. And after the holiday, he went to visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe knew that he lives in the city where these two guys are fighting. So he asked him, he said, Reptuvia, maybe you could make peace. It would be a big thing if we could make shalom between these two institutions. So he said he could try, but he tried before it was ineffective. They're just, you know, fighting with each other. So the Rebbe told him, it says in Medrash, that on Shavuot, God came down from heaven to earth, and Hashem told Moshe, go from earth to heaven. It says, before Shavuot, before Sinai, heaven didn't come down to earth, and earth didn't go up to heaven. But once Sinai happened, God came down, the higher reality came down, Hashem came down, and then He told Moshe, you go up, the lower reality came up. So, so the Rebbe says, this is Shavuos, it's a time of peace. The Elyonim and the Tachtoinim come together, the higher reality and the lower reality come together, they have to meet, just like heaven and earth, Hashem and, and the Jewish people on, on Shavuot, on Sinai, they met, they made peace. So Reb Tuvia is standing there and he says, he's speaking to himself, this is a great message to tell them, right? Go tell them. The higher one should come down to the lower, and the lower one should go up to the, 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 to the higher one. Who's higher and who's lower? So the Rebbe, almost like reading his thoughts, says to him, and how do you know who's higher and who's lower? How do you know? How do you know who's El Yoinim and who's Tachtoinim? And what's the answer? He says, I'll tell you how you know. The one who approaches the other one first. Because it says that Hashem came down first, and then he told Moshe to come up. So the higher one went down, and then the lower one went up. So he says, how do you know which one of them is higher and which one is lower? The one who reaches out first. That's the higher one. And that's a very profound statement in life. Because when you have the courage to reach out, it means you're in a higher place. You're not living in you know, a sandbox. You don't get involved in the mud and the dirt and the filth. You live in a higher place. And when you live in a higher place, you can reach out. It's not below your dignity because you don't need this big narcissistic ego to survive. You just live in a much more authentic and deeper place. And you realize that you don't have to be right. You have to be happy. 
much more important than being right. Rabbi Jacobson, the yes. person who wants to know how to forgive someone, how to heal from the pain, when the person who caused the pain to you doesn't feel bad about it, they don't feel they did anything wrong. It's very how hard. Do it yeah. So, uh, how do you forgive that relationship and how do you heal from that relationship? Yes, excellent, excellent question. The answer to this is, first of all, it's not always easy to forgive. If the person didn't apologize and they don't even regret it, it's not easy to forgive. But I would say two things. First of all, can you have a conversation with them? Maybe you could share with them what happened. Because sometimes people really don't see things. I mean, I know in my life, I've communicated with people. Sometimes I know it for myself. Sometimes I'll say something in a class and somebody gets hurt and I didn't even mean it but they took it very personal and they tell it to me and then I can apologize. So the first thing is, I want to know, did you do that? Can you have a conversation with them or maybe send somebody else if you're not comfortable or send an email and explain to them what they did? You may be shocked because maybe they don't know what they did. So that's number one. It's very important because I know a lot of fights that ended this way. They simply communicated. Somebody came to me and said, Rabbi, you know, you said this and you insulted me. I said something to somebody's wife at a wedding. He calls, emails me and says, you made such a problem in my house. I thought I made a little joke and it became a whole thing. So what did I do? I apologized. I apologized. <laughs> and it's over. I hope it's over. I apologize. I apologized once. I apologized twice. So that's the first thing. Communicate. Now, you may have done that. Or even after you do that, the person says, I don't know what you're talking about. I never did anything. You're a baby. You're a this. You're a that. And you know what? You'll feel much better after that communication because then you'll be able to make a choice of forgiveness from your own wholesomeness. When you realize that your inner core is divine, nobody can break it. They can insult you. They can do bad things to you. But your inner infinite core is like Hashem. It's a chelik elikamimal. It's invincible and it's destructible. It's indestructible. When I could go to that place, that's the place where I can heal from, and that's the place where I can forgive. Am I obligated to forgive if the person didn't apologize? I'm not. I'm not. You're not obligated to forgive somebody if they don't say, I'm sorry. However, back to Darizal. Darizal's yard said is hey of, so it's appropriate to speak about Darizal. Darizal instituted a prayer every night before Kriyat Shema. I don't know if you know this. But Darizal, those who pray in the Nusach of Arizal know before the night Shema, there's a Nusach, a beautiful text of the Arizal. He goes like this, I forgive all those who angered me, provoked me, sinned against me in my body or my money or my honor. Okay. Whether they did it by mistake or willingly or inadvertently, whether they did it through speech or through actions, whether they did it in this reincarnation or in a previous reincarnation. And I ask God, don't punish anybody because of what they did to me. Darizal felt that before you go to sleep, you owe it to yourself and to the world to cleanse yourself from this. It's not an obligation. It's not an obligation. Because if you're not sincere, then don't do it. But if you can get to that place of wholesomeness, it's a very powerful tool. However, the first thing, talk to them, because you may be shocked. They may simply not understand. If after everything, nothing helps, try to find in yourself your divine wholesomeness. And remember something else. Everyone who hurts us, from their perspective, they may be trying to hurt us. But God is the only one who runs this world. The reason Hashem allowed this to happen to me is to make me a much more powerful person. They may have had bad intentions and they may have been absolutely wrong, but they don't control your life. The reason why Hashem allowed them to affect you this way is ultimately for you to grow, for you to learn about yourself, for you to find inner strength. And if you can do that, then you take the hurt and you transform it into a catalyst for unprecedented growth. Now, I know it's easier said than done. And I'm not trying to minimize the pain. I'm not trying to reduce the hurt. I'm not trying to make light of people who have said or have done hurtful things. I am not at all doing that. I, am, I will tell you that pain is very serious and sometimes very, very deep. 
and sometimes surreal and unfathomable. And sometimes you're not in a position to forgive. And you know what? That's fine. That's fine. They didn't ask for forgiveness. And you may not be in that position. But remember, continue to grow, continue to heal, continue to believe in your invincible divine self that nobody can shatter and nobody can break. And the more you align yourself with that, the less you align yourself with being a victim of that person. Think about my words now, and I hope you can internalize them. Rabbi Jacobson, someone asked, I'm not sure what this is, if you can share the story of the couple that you said in Lakewood. Is it connected to today's talk? It's connected, but I'll be honest with you. Somebody told me that they read the story from an art scroll book. So I reached out to the publisher and I asked them for the source and I couldn't get the source of the story. So I started to doubt its authenticity. So I stopped saying the story. <laughs> so you'll forgive me. I don't, I don't, no, no, I, I, you know, I like sharing stories, but I always try to say the source because I feel it's very important for stories to be authentic, unless you're saying it's a fictional story. I have no problem with somebody saying a, telling a fictional story. This story I read, I thought it was authentic. I tried to verify the source, and I realized that it's very shabby and very mysterious, and I don't feel comfortable saying it anymore, so I'm not saying it anymore. Forgive me. It's a great story, but I don't think it's true. <laughs> First question is, a person that had no relationship with the father for many years, the father abandoned the family, and the father dies, and the child does not feel he wants to say Kaddish for his father. First question. Second question, a different person's question is, if I've tried to ask, apologize to someone, and he's not accepted my apology, what can I do? So you have two on Okay. I'm going to answer the second question first, because it's just easier. The bottom line is, just try again. Every, I would do, especially if it's family or a closer relationship, try again. Don't give up. Don't, you don't stoop, don't become petty. Wait a month, wait six months, wait three months, send a card, send an email, give a call, send a gift. You reach out and do what you have to do. We're, you know, people sometimes live in their own pain and their own orbit, and I feel bad if they can't forgive. But don't take it personal and get angry. They may be in their own limited space. They may have their own trauma. But don't stop. Before Yom Kippur, soon Yom Kippur is coming, send a card, send a gift, send an email, call up, make a meeting, try to go out for coffee. If they keep on refusing, they keep on refusing. But from your side, don't stop. And another important thing, this is the famous idea of Kamayim Hapanam Lapanam Kain Lev HaAdam Adam. The face that we show the water is the face that the water shows back to us. When I show the mirror a smile, the mirror smiles. When I show the mirror a sour face, the mirror is sour. When we cultivate in our hearts love to another person, they are almost forced to love us back. You know that there's people, by the way, you meet and you just say to yourself, I like them. You don't know why. You never did business with them. You never hung out with them. You never went on a hiking trip with them to the Himalayas. You just like them. You know, you see certain people. You just like, I don't know, I like this guy. You know, why? Why? And one of the reasons is because he likes you. <laughs> and human hearts are like a mirror. If I show, if I have love towards you, you may not even know that I have love towards you, but automatically that love comes back to me. You love me. So I say to you, even though there have been differences and there's an issue and they're not forgiving you and they don't want to listen, speak to you, try as much as possible to find love to them. Because that in itself is a very powerful tool. The law of attraction. Remember what we spoke last time about trach gut v'zayin gut? When I think positively about you, it actually creates something in your brain as well. So try to stay in that space. Be understanding, be forgiving, continue to reach out and try to create positive interactions and do not allow their difficulties to define your relationship. In terms of your, uh, of your, your question about Kaddish, you say the, the father did not love him, did not, is this the last question, did not treat him right, abandon the family, is that the question? 
it's a tough one. <laughs> it's a tough one. You had a father who was not loving, abandoned the family, treated everybody in an inappropriate way, died, and uh, your friend doesn't want to say Kaddish. I see there's another story, another question here. I don't know if it's the same person. The father of a friend abandoned his family when he was a child of four or five years. The friend contacted his father after 30 years if they could reestablish a relationship and have his father in his life. The father was very rude to my friend and he ignored him. And now he died. I guess it's all the same story. I didn't realize. What should I tell you? What should I tell you? Okay. Kaddish is a big schus for the soul of a father or a mother, the person we say Kaddish. In this situation, you may, it's very possible, I think you should have a good conversation with a rabbi whom you trust, who is wise, confid, confidant of yours, and empathetic. Somebody who understands people's emotions, because some people are more smart in their brain. They have IQ, but not EQ. So you want to speak to somebody who has also emotional intelligence, not just intellectual intelligence, to discuss the details, because I hear what you're writing, but I think it's a good idea for you to have a conversation with this person, with a good rabbi who understands this. I'm just going to give you more of a general perspective that could be helpful. And that is, if the Kaddish is going to cause you pain and you're going to feel abused through the Kaddish and you're going to feel that not only did your father get away with murder, now he's even getting the mitzvah of Kaddish. And therefore, every time you say Kaddish, you're going to want to curse your father and you're going to get even more angry at your father. Then I'm not sure that it's the right thing for you. Probably under your circumstances, you're not obligated to say the Kaddish. And the reason is your father chose to abandon you. Your father chose to neglect you. What is even worse? After, as an adult, you wanted to reach out to him and he completely wasn't interested in you. So basically, your father abandoned every level of connection with his child. And therefore, from that perspective, a father who behaves in this fashion and in this way you're probably not obligated to say Kaddish for your father. So that's number one. You don't have to feel guilty because under these circumstances, you're not obligated to say the Kaddish. But I want to add something else. And that is, and I cannot tell this to you, I'm just sharing this thought. I want you to realize that your father had some serious, serious problems. The poor guy not only abandoned his family, but even as an adult wouldn't want to connect with you. This means this guy was really messed up. And that's why I'm calling him poor guy, not because he didn't hurt you, but because he was really messed up. Which father, normal father, abandons his family? And then even after that, let's say he found a love somewhere, so he ran away. But you have kids as adults who want to connect to you. So your father was really, really messed up emotionally and psychologically in a very deep way. Why that is, I don't know. I didn't know who your father was and I don't know his stories. I don't know. But it's very obvious that this guy's soul is pretty, pretty, was pretty warped and pretty distorted. And if that's the case, I want to know this. After you can find healing in yourself, and I hope you could, by realizing that your father was just so messed up and he couldn't be here for you. His loss and your loss. But you cannot let that destroy you. Can you then really say, there's room in me to have compassion on his neshama that was so trapped. And if you can evoke that, then maybe from that place, you could come and say Kaddish. Not from a place of guilt and duty, but really from a place of compassion for a soul that was dressed up in a body that was quite challenged and struggling. And if you could reach that place in an earnest fashion, then that's maybe an opening where you'll be able to say Kaddish or give charity for his soul or learn Mishnayas for his soul or learn Torah for his soul 
or do something else for his soul. I would just add that it's worthwhile to have in communities, you pay somebody a couple of dollars a year or a month, $100, $200, $300, that somebody says Kaddish. So even if you don't want to say Kaddish, it's a good thing because every soul ultimately has its journey and its tikkun. And I think ultimately you won't regret, even if you're not ready for it, to just somebody, a relative could pay a couple of dollars to somebody and they say Kaddish. And I think you won't regret that. Because a soul is a gift from Hashem, and just because he messed up, it doesn't mean he didn't have a soul, and it doesn't mean he's not your father, and ultimately you're here in the world because of him. So I think you will not regret hiring somebody. It's not a lot of money. You just give them some gift, people who come to shul and say, Kaddish, you can ask the rabbis in Panama, they'll, they'll, they'll right away set you up with somebody. There's people all over the world who do this 180 bucks a year. It's mamish nothing. And that, that I would suggest regardless. That's what I have to say. Rabbi Jason, thank you very much for your time, for your insights, for your teachings. Thank you, Rabbi Lane. Thank you for the privilege. Long life, and Mr. Mitchison will we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bracha v'hatzloch, everybody. Chazak, chazak, v'nis chazek. And since the Gemara says in Yumid Aftes that the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed because of baseless hatred, why is it baseless? Because people believed stupid things about their friend. Right? They believe that you're trying to harm me. So I hated you, even though it wasn't true. So when we get rid of the cause, we get rid of the effect. So if we get rid of all the baseless hatred between us, we'll get rid of the effect of it, which was gullus, and we'll have very speedily, even before the end of this Tisha B'Av, Binyan Beis HaMiktash HaShlishi B'mheira B'yameinu, Amen V'Amen. Thank you. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.